LibreOffice showed up on the Windows Store. No one told the Open Document Foundation about it. And using a Pi to drive a UPS for a Pi. Round two. And Music Brains Picard finally gets a 2.0 release. And we still don't know how it works. And Lubuntu will discontinue i386, unless there is testing from the community. And PeerTube has reached their funding goal. Now they just have to figure out what to do with it. And a journalist decided to take the Ubuntu challenge and lived to tell the tale. It's going to be interesting to find out more on that, because it's another great day for Linux, everyone. So let's go. Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we like to sit back, relax, and take a um, bit of a break and talk about some of the fun things that we found going on in the world of open source, floss, penguins, you name it. It's all that business. I'm Vince Stone, joined every week by Jill, who is getting ready to head to Vegas in L.A. and uh, in Britannia. You know him. One Pedro Mateus. Hello. Keeping it real <laughs> there. Uh, so... What's been new since last week, Jill? I, I, I kind of oh. joked around, but you are actually going to Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah, I really am. Um, and I've been uh, getting together my mobile broadcasting rig to broadcast from the Star Trek convention, at least um, probably for Jordan's show and the Friday Foo Bar. <laughs> so for our stream Thursday and Friday. And um, I got my Asus Republic of Gamers 17.3 inch laptop. My big beast is coming with me. <laughs> and I got my bought a nice mic for it. And hopefully it'll all work and the internet will be happy at the hotel. <laughs> Good times. How's the island treating you, my man? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, making me feel rather lonely. Yes. Uh, so uh, a while back, me and Nori decided that uh, let's go to Portugal uh, in the summer. And then I looked at the price, uh, price for the uh, plane tickets. And it's like, don't you just want to, you know, uh, go yourself? And she did. So I'm all alone. Wow, that, that's blood was it. Sounds sounds good. Peace <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> true story. So uh, I've been playing around. I was talking about in the pre-show. I was like, oh, I'm just seeing CSS and all this fun stuff everywhere. Because after eight years, I counted mm -hmm. because I was looking through archives because I was messing around with stuff. Um, we're going to be doing an update to LinuxGameCast.com and try to bring it kicking and screaming into like maybe 2014 web standards. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got most of it slapped out. I still got a gang of plumbing to do on the back end. And, uh, you know, empty empties offered to at least look into like one kind of small, huge, massive thing. And, um, he seems to think it's doable. So we'll find out more about that when it sporadically just gets updated. And I forget to mention it. All right. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. So let's just get right into uh, Microsoft and LibreOffice. Yes, because something showed up on the Windows Store and it was, uh, well, it raised a lot of red flags. It's LibreOffice on the Windows Store and it <laughs> costs $2.99. <laughs> hmm. So people were like, Wait, is this legit? Are you guys like uh, charging the uh, the stupid tax if people actually want to get LibreOffice from the Windows Store? And uh, LibreOffice said, "Look, we have been made aware of an unofficial version of LibreOffice on the Microsoft Store. It's not official or created by us, and the money is not collected by us, so the apps page is misleading. LibreOffice can be downloaded for free at no cost from LibreOffice.org, where you should always go and get it, unless you're running <laughs> Linux, then it's probably in your distro's repos. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not legit, so do not install it, or, you know, if you happen to have a VM that you're uh, confident that won't get uh, hijacked, by all means, try it. Let mm. us know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th that was... Kind of one of those interesting things that, A, that you could even do this, and I, I don't know if it's still up, but I checked it yesterday, and I think I checked it this morning. It was still available. It's like, Microsoft, really? This is something that should be nuked from orbit. Why don't you just go ahead and throw a copy of Office on uh, GitHub? That might be more <laughs> interesting. But yeah, as you pointed out, man, they, they have nothing to do with this. They're not collecting money. Uh, Jill? Yeah, and, well, you know, I was I was just curious if Microsoft was not happy with the Office 
open document format becoming the international standard. Maybe mm -hmm. they're a little upset about that. <laughs> so, uh, but probably not. It probably just is a, they're just <clears throat> not thinking and, and not paying attention. I don't know. <laughs> Again, no, <laughs> yeah. They say never attribute to malice, which can be adequately explained by stupidity. However, yes. it is Microsoft, so do not rule out malice. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, next, uh, the internet kind of talked about this last week, but this is a two-parter. Um, Jason, a writer at Forbes, hi, you follow me on Twitter. Uh, a few weeks ago, he decided to spend two weeks with Ubuntu on a Dell XPS 13, which I initially thought, that's a smart move considering, like, yeah, and it's, it's a Dell XPS. They're kind of made for Linux, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> and yes. He just walks through, you know, switching over, getting everything together. And, you know, it's like Windows 10's finally upset me. And his experience setting it up. And in, he, I think he said exactly he decided to take the nuclear option, which I was kind of curious is. Can, can we really say Linux is the nuclear option in 2018? I guess by nuclear, he uh, meant the, the, the drive. Just nuke it and uh, start fresh. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I, <laughs> I got from that. <laughs> nuke and pave. <laughs> yeah. So he kind of talks, he's like, years ago, I remember having to manually select size and drive partitions. He kind of walks through all that. And I was a little bit perplexed by this jill because if i remember correctly mm -hmm. the years ago was he talking decades ago because i do believe red hat uh had some basic auto partitioning back in the 90s oh yeah yeah that uh yeah partitioning has not been an issue on linux for many many years as we know <laughs> and actually for those of us who've been using it forever never was an issue um, and in fact, even in way back as curl, draw and mandrake, we had partitioning, <laughs> but what was, what was really awesome about that article and, uh, because of the overwhelming response from the readers in the Linux community, he wrote a new article, um, uh, talking about, uh, talking about the five reasons you should switch from windows to Linux right now. And they were all really, really good points. And of course, those of us in the community already knew what these points would be. Um, but uh, one was uh, that you can up updates aren't a headache uh, under Linux, like they're uh, un under Windows, they're glorious. And as we know, uh, update process in, in Linux is it does you don't have to update each app individually like you do in Windows, but it updates all of them at once. Wow, yeah. isn't that a thing? <laughs> and, and as much as it pains me to admit it, it's uh, it's been kind of a sad week for me because the two most popular Linux stories, news things have been this, Jason Evangelio getting uh, Linux to work on his XPS and that Linus Tech Tips video that we'll talk about on Saturday. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we talk, of course, we're going to talk about that on Saturday. Um, he was really happy about the Snap Store. That was like um, a yeah. revelation. He's like, look, everything's in one place and it's a good take and all that. Uh, ironically, I'm going to say with Ubuntu, uh, you might want to do that manual partition because home directory should be a thing that it's not mm -hmm. necessarily yeah. a thing. Yeah. So, uh, Good on you, mate. I'm um, glad you enjoyed it. Stick with it. Linux is not the big scary command line thing that uh, some people try to make it out to be. Hmm? Yeah, mm -hmm. and he actually he loved. He also loved the community, so that's really positive. That's new. And, <laughs> yeah, and that, <laughs> that was new. And actually, one one quick point is I love how he talks about using and switching to Linux from the perspective of your average Windows user, which mm -hmm. is really really good. And is uh, perfect for the average Forbes user, which is your average user. Let's just face it. But you know they're very intelligent users, but uh, readers. But it's it's they're 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 uh, uh, probably We're not, not going to be featured Linux on Forbes, Jill. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, <you. laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's going to be a thing. Uh, let's see. What do we have? Written? I don't see an Arch logo. Hmm. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm just saying, he's probably heard about that. Uh, what do we get up next? Peertube? 
That's the thing. Uh, yeah. No, it's uh, or or is yes, it is. Yes. I, I, oh, I, um, I am working off of the old like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it earlier. PeerTube, the decentralized YouTube, has succeeded in crowdfunding. Hundred percent, it's a thing. Uh, Would have lost the bet on this, but yes. <laughs> honestly, I'm pleasantly surprised they ended up with. 53,100 euros. That's 266% of what they were looking for. Uh, they plan to get version one out by the end of October. It's going to have localization for interfaces, uh, languages, all that fun stuff, RSS feeds, improved search, a lot of good stuff. Uh, what else? And subscriptions. I know that's been a big thing. A lot of people have been looking for. Uh, we're currently on Peer2 because I was given some advice billions of years ago by uh, one of the creators of Cyanide and Happiness. And he's like, how do you be number one in the comic? He's like, be the first. He was talking about <laughs> webcomic. So I just went ahead and threw everything on there. Um, but if we're going to be honest, I'm going to say like in its current state with PeerTube and what little I've played around with it, what's setting up our two uh, channel for the show and uh, Linux Teamcast is, is kind of more of a tech demo than anything <laughs> else. And like it or not, I, Pedro, I think you, you got a little point on this. Mm -hmm. Going to have to come up with a way to police some of the content. Yes, it <laughs> yeah. only took a couple of scrolls of the wheel in any of the instances that I visited to find the so-called mature content. So, yeah, it's all <laughs> well and good having a decentralized video hosting website. But there's some stuff that can get you in really hot water. Just saying. <laughs> well, I mean, between that and... You know they're sitting away and it's like, we need some way to get our bots in there to DMCA all the things because, let's face it, I mean, we're on the Mastodon host mm -hmm. because they have the most storage and, you know, we're doing hour-long content. But you look at the live feeds and, I mean, it's just pirated content. And French, and French, <laughs> oh, yeah. and French concert <laughs> videos. One of the two. I, I don't see the connection. Jill... <laughs> Yeah, I actually, you know, I was the same way as, you know, Ven and Pedro. I never really, really thought this would go anywhere. But with all the recent issues with uh, YouTube blocking videos, like from the Blender Foundation, mm -hmm. it seemed, you know, uh, it, it seems to have taken off, especially in the Linux community and open source community. So that, that's that been really awesome. Well, I hope mm -hmm. it's a better love story than Mastodon turned out to be. And yes, I look yeah. forward to your hate mail next week. It's still growing. <laughs> it's a million users. And I'm like, it's... Uh, how many active users is that again? Two? Okay. <laughs> Seven, dude. Quit lying to people. Uh, <laughs> hey, I, I like the federated decentralized idea. Um, it does boil down to being able to find, organize, and subscribe to the content that you want, yeah. and you got to have the people there. So we, we've did our part. We moved our stuff over there. So <laughs> I-386 is a thing still. Yeah, uh, Lubuntu is going to stop support for 32-bit hardware going forward unless there is more activity from users downloading and testing the 32-bit ISOs from the ISO Q&A tracker for i386 and filing bug, bug reports with Launchpad. Um, we talked about this on LWW last week because the 1804 LTS release of Ubuntu will be uh, the last to support older 32-bit um, hardware. And, you know, I had made a comment, well, if they're going to continue to support 32-bit, um, um, they're going to have to switch to another base such as Debian. So, um, but this is actually, you know, it's it's sad, but, you know, we knew it might happen, but uh, actually, but because this was a, a lightweight OS, I was kind of hoping they would still <laughs> support 32-bit. Um, uh, still, still support my 486s back there because <laughs> I do use it on some of the older <laughs> machines, <laughs> and I did download the ISO so I, I could test it. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I mean, kind of looking yeah. at it, I was reading between the lines, and it came across to me more as like, listen, Canonical's killing i386, and we're based on that. So you know what? Peace out. Um, we're not going to yeah. be switching to anything, and we're going to keep using our system like we have it set up, and. Listen, I know people are just like, ah, but you know what? It's I-386. It's dead, Jim. VMs, yeah. they're a thing. Yeah. Let it go. I, I will want to say one thing, though. Um, you know, internationally, there's still a lot of countries, third world countries using this older hardware. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, it, it will, would be nice to have, have more distro support for that older hardware, but Debian is there. Um, some of the other uh, um, open source projects in the community, like Computers for Kids, use um, Antics and some of the Debian deriv derivatives on the old laptops that go into, you know, the uh, kids' schools for in poor countries. So um, that that is a thing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and there is an argument to be made. It's like, oh yeah, preservation of old hardware, but still enabling it to run up to date New versions of software. It's, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, it is absolutely a thing. But are you really, really that attached <laughs> to that two thousand and nine Atom netbook that you can't update to anything more recent? Yeah. Please? <laughs> hey man, I love my old retro hardware. Uh, yeah. D42, I do, and it's running Lubuntu uh, 1804, but when that goes away, it, it, it's just <laughs> like something to go on a shelf somewhere. It's like, yes, it's a D42. Yes, it still works. But I'm not going to use it. <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, I really want someone to give me uh, send in some feedback for next week. I mean, if you have a legitimate use case for having a modern up-to-date distro for your i3d6 system you know mm -hmm. i mean i think it'd be great you know maybe you got a bunch of old boxes that always confuses me it's like look at all my retro computers i keep running i'm like why do you hate the environment do you know how power inefficient <laughs> those things are i mean you, you, it's like just just go cut down a tree it'll be quicker um <laughs> all right uh what do we got coming up next jill oh um this is yes. from uh yes. the <laughs> Frizo. Yeah, yeah Frizo are in, in chat. And the music tagger Music Brains Picard has a new major release after six years. Um, that's that's really awesome. And what this is, it's 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 an open source software application for identifying, tagging, and organizing digital audio recordings, such as from um, uh, compact discs, MP3s, waves, flax, and, and whatnot. And it was developed by the MetaBrains Foundation, a nonprofit company that also oper operates the Music Brains database. And it, it is the back end for all our multimedia players under, under Linux, including VLC, Kodi, Clementine, Rhythmbox, Soundjuicer for uh, labeling uh, music. And um, I've actually been using this for years to catalog my, my ambient music collection. Uh, mostly from CD, and it, and it catalogs the disk, uh, the ones that it can find in the database, and it does a really good job. And it's it's often it, it's very good at finding rare, um, going through music and and, identif and identifying rare uh, tracks. And yes, as we stated earlier, our patron Frezo and. Frezzo in Chat Realm is the community manager of the Music Brains Foundation. And we interviewed him on LWWD back in 2016. And I have the link for that in the show notes. <laughs> we love Frezzo. <laughs> you know, you just said all that, but Pedro, I still don't know what it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I'm sort of in that camp because, yeah, in theory, it's it's something that goes through your uh, your music collection <laughs> and tags everything accordingly. Uh, the twenty something gigs of MP3s I have in my external hard drive, I set Picard loose on him, and most of them still got labeled unknown, unknown. So yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a neat project. It's great that it's open yeah. source, and you know, to keep track of stuff. You know, for if you don't know what an ID three tag is, and that's not your thing. Mm -hmm. uh, good. I don't know. Like I said, I am not 100% on it. Uh, yeah, I know uh, Matthew uh, Strider uses it all the time, too. <laughs> I'm glad it works. Now, I'm guessing it basically serves as a back-end to other programs. Yeah, though, so. yeah. It, it does. It does. That's where I, I mostly utilize it. <laughs> hmm. Good times. And as Joe pointed out, all this business will be in our show notes. Uh, link will be in the description or just head over to Linux Gamecast, where that nightmare fuel will reside. So... Why would you want to do this? I don't know, but now you can. That's right. Uh, let's say you need GPS inside of your PC. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Pedro, you, mm -hmm. why don't you start us off on this? Because it, it takes an interesting turn of events when you get to the end versus what's actually in this. 
the board. Uh-huh. It's awesome. <laughs> it's uh, no, it's I read through the thing, and yes, it's a very well uh, written tutorial, and it gives you all the necessary steps about how to use your phone as a GPS, uh, anything for your laptop or your computer, whatever. Uh, and going from there, I'm like, wait, the new uh, WAN uh, broadband cards that you could get for laptops nowadays, they all have GPS modules in them. You can use those as a GPS thing. And it's really actually really hard to find one that doesn't unless you go on eBay. But then again, if you're going on eBay, you can get a GPS card, uh, GPS enabled WAN card for like three pounds. So, eh. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, what I'm saying is um, if you have one of those new WAN cards, you don't need your phone. Mm-hmm. You don't need to go through, mm-hmm. admittedly, a very convoluted process just to get that GPS information to your computer. This is like four minutes and 50 lines of code, man. A. <laughs> Three pounds, you plug it in. It's like, oh, look, GPS. <laughs> <laughs> but you would make a horrible MacGyver. You just get shot because it, it gives you the stuff to do it. And you're like, nope, just, just pull the trigger, man. Can't be done. <laughs> I recognize that, yes, it is a neat project and it's Linux Weekly Little Wednesdays. Uh, neat is basically our bread and butter when it comes to stuff like this. It's a and- cool project for getting your GPS data bits into your PC. If you don't have another way to do it and you're curious, maybe it's, you need something to do on a Saturday afternoon. Come on. It could be that. But, I mean, it's simple. It's GPSD, Android, GPSD client, and GS pipe. That's basically it. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I, I 100% agree with Pedro because I went to the Amazons. And you get like a global set, like a nice GPS for yeah. like 30 what stinky American caches. And that's just USB. Click, done. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, Jill, do you like the government tracking you? Uh, <laughs> no, no. But I, I do like that this project uses OpenStreetMap. I thought that was really cool because that's uh, a really awesome uh, map service. I've actually contributed to it. <laughs> Well, that'd be great, man. You can take your UPS, put it in like a buggy with your uh, desktop. And I, I don't know where I'm going with that. Just uh, yeah. I, I, I've never had a looking UPS. buggy in a road somewhere. Let's not shoot it down. Oh, wait, no. Hi, NSA. It's kind of brilliant. Anyway, fun project. Moving on to something that made me happy for all the wrong reasons, because I've seen people, several people, screeching about this issue much to my amusement um so (laughs) someone has finally sorted it that something is xfc panel indicator plugin background fix yeah apparently the colors didn't line up or something and that actually genuinely distraught you would think by reading um our xfce but here's a quick little fix it takes two seconds pedro you said this is all on gtk3 though right yeah no this is absolutely mm-hmm. a gtk3 uh thing though in this specific case it's compounded by the fact that the xfce panel is built on top of gtk2 so when you mesh the two together some mm-hmm. things don't get inherited properly and the background color for the indicator plugin is one of them so, yeah, no, with a couple of lines of CSS, all you have to do is replace the uh, at dark BG color from the code that the person left on his uh, blog post there and just, yeah, set it to whatever your uh, your panel background is and you're good to go. I got, I got a better solution. I'll tell you a way to fix it even quicker. D- don't worry about things. <laughs> don't use it. <laughs> that, close your eyes. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> Jill, does this type of stuff bother yeah. you? Because I mean, speaking of eyes, actually, I, I rolled oh, my it, eyes when I saw this. No, no, like, no. Really. It, it actually actually does. I was really quite happy about this. I've also seen this on uh, GNOME and Unity uh, as an issue as well. So yeah. it's not just XFCE. And my uh, second thinking- thought is there a way to force it to do this? Because I would do it just out of spite, knowing it wouldn't. Yes. Oh, it does it by default now. So yeah. Hey, hey Ben, all you got to do is give give someone an, a, a copy of LXDE, and it'll be all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Theming issues. I don't know. Some people yeah. like their pretties. I mean, listen, there was a time, a long time ago, when I would spend more than. Oh, does it work? Is it functional? Okay, let's use it. Like trying to make something pretty, like matching icon sets and stuff. Those days are gone, kids. 
No, no, I still do it. I still do it. I have. Admittedly, I have fallen back to the mainstream, and it's adapter for the desktop theme and the papyrus icons. And yeah, no, that looks good. But mm. Fair. <laughs> I just I just copy all my configs for all my computers and all the different um, <clears throat> window managers like Window Maker and Flexbox. It works, you know. I just cut so I have my nice themes and I just copy them from one computer to the next. <laughs> so not my thing, man. Um, some people like it though. Some people like it. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like we like you, um, all the beautiful people making this show possible. 116 patrons, because we got this crazy business model where we just give everything away for free and we don't do ads or anything like that. And you guys like keep doing it. Here, here's a buck a week. That's all we're asking. Um, 250 per Saturday night train wreck. That's how that works. Uh, becoming a patron, pretty simple, pretty easy. I am one myself. Um, you're going to get access to a gang of stuff, Pedro. What do we have for the beautiful people that throw some quarters at our face? If you throw some quarters at us, you can get access to the lovely, lovely Discord where uh, mm -hmm. everyone else likes to hang out and be generally uh, amazing. No, it, it's a ghost town, <laughs> didn't you? Have you read what Strider said? Oh, it's a ghost town. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, Strider is always trying to pick fights with someone. He always drops the very controversial opinions. They're, they are his legit opinions, uh, but he's always looking for someone to uh, argue with him on it. And it's besides that, you also get access to the super secret sauce that comes with the uh, the playlist, which and the RSS feed, of course, that will uh, give you access to the pre pre super chosen and uh, whatever else we decide mm -hmm. to trial that week, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it is great you you, you lot make this possible and we keep on trucking uh we're doing like four shows five shows a week something like that yeah it, it's kind of terrifying uh <laughs> but we like doing yeah. it and keeping us honest we're, we're able to bring jill on we'd like to do more so yep head over there and uh and there's still the promise of a log cabin inside a missile silo somewhere in Kansas. There is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, now, we do got to think. Uh, you know Darkwing and Patron. He's chilling out in our Discord chat. He writes, uh, he sent a little gift for us because you can pick us up uh, some things on our wish zone because we're trying to build out the studio for cool stuff to do extra things and without explosions. Ooh. Um, <laughs> so he bought us some medicine? He bought us some medicine because the last week and earlier the week before that, because we're setting up Jill's coming through her own box. Like Jordan, they're on the test box right now and then we're getting everything hammered out. One of the encoders was running on USB two, which would sporadically go into seizure mode, <laughs> which I found hilarious. Um, however, on the receiving end of that, uh, uh -oh. you know, motion sickness, vomit and all that. <laughs> and the reason that was is because the 2.0 USB ports needed to be upgraded. So Dan picked us up a two port USB 3.0 plug and popped that in PCI. It works at Alytics and thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. That helps out. Uh, Much appreciated. <laughs> I've also ordered one more encoder card direct off the slow boat from Singapore. So as I told Jill, somewhere between 12 and 20 days. Yeah, <laughs> that shows up. We're gonna give that a try, and I think we only got that one more little piece. Uh, monitor, just basic things, and we'll we'll have this Bifrost thing kicked in the teeth. Yay! <laughs> then we can start bringing guests on because that means Yay! everybody's locked into hardware. That means we have a software channel. Like Pedro's, <laughs> Pedro's on a software channel right now, and mm -hmm. um, then I, then I'm gonna set Jill loose. I'm like, all right, Joe, who do you want to talk to? But we gotta do them oh, one at a time. <laughs> I actually already have a list of people. <laughs> I'm willingly doing this to myself, people. Um, so let's take a break and have a slice of pie. Um, uh, tell me about it. So uh, the first one is uh, a little bit of a rehash. And uh, thank you very much, Jill, for reminding me uh, that uh, someone decided to create uh, a bit of a UPS for a Raspberry Pi using... You guessed it, another Raspberry Pi. Was it witchcraft? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. They Aww. used another Pi. They used the Pi Zero as the control board for a yeah. uh, fourteen thousand five hundred uh, lithium ion did, did, battery. Did, did they call it the Pi Zibit? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not exactly within a pie, but it's it's getting there. Uh, it's uh, yeah, no, it's literally just a, a lithium ion uh, little power pack mounted on top of the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, and the uh, the Zero controls the power output to the Raspberry Pi Three that you connect it to. So if you ever lose power, uh, the battery will let you run the Pi for as long as it'll last. So it's interesting. It's just. It's fun, yes, but redundant. I mean, you're using a Pi as a control board to power. <laughs> another Pi. Really? <laughs> then you just need to make another smaller. <laughs> or do we know? No, uh, then you use those two Pi's to drive, like, an Android tablet. <laughs> it was <not> even <laughs> yeah. This is neat, mainly because it's, it's cute. It's adorable. I want to pinch it it's like little lithium cheeks. Yeah. And... Uh, mm. Julia, it's an alternative UPS, but yeah. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. what are they using in this thing? Some, uh, oh, a 14, fifth, well, a 14,500 lithium ion, which I was like, wait a minute, why yeah. do we do that? I mean, you should be using like an 18,650 or 2,700 or 21,700, which ironically would probably power up by an entire day. Um, if you were yeah. doing a heavy load on it. For a single pie, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is neat because it's smart enough to go, hey, man, I got power. Let's charge the circuit. And mm -hmm. it'll charge the pile. It's like, I don't have power. Uh, I guess if you wanted to do, like, very limited mobile computing. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, they, they are very uh, clearly targeting this at the UPS. Pedro, it's uh, me. I'm going to make case. it do something it's not supposed to. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm guessing this is more along the lines, oh, do you have, like, digital signage that's running Pies in the background? Yeah. Well, you can make a bunch of Pi Zero right. UPSs, attach them, boom, done. But look, ch Chibs beat Chibs <laughs> actually has a very good point. I mean, security cameras, battery backup. Yeah, yeah definitely. So definitely. And and this is smaller than the other ones that we've talked about. Remember, kids, steal the security cameras. <laughs> <laughs> good idea. And the hard drives uh storing the stuff because those are usually very good hard drives hi nsa <laughs> do cloud backup seriously uh, that's the only good thing about ring is it's it's too late i've been meaning to make a sign just like put in the middle of the house and it's like yeah you're on a server somewhere in california good luck have a picture of jigsaw it'd be great um <laughs> behind the shed what's this about yeah and yeah. uh well uh the last story is about shed built gnu slash linux yeah yeah they went there uh so uh shell built glue plus linux as i have recently taken to calling it is a uh it's a distro that you can use on your arm prototype be it a pie Ooh. be it whatever it's uh ooh. Spoilers. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, yeah, it is very much a distro designed at education. It's meant for people who are tinkering with the boards to try and get uh, something to work. But it, they are very clear to state that this isn't something you should be using in a production environment. It's a tinker thing. It's an education thing, not for uh, actual real world use. Uh, they do say it runs mm -hmm. stuff like scum vm and probably several of the doom um the original doom source ports mm -hmm. uh it's it runs retro arch so yeah that's a gaming machine right there if you have the prototype board to run it in and uh what they do is they specifically build shed built linux on arm for arm uh there's no like uh cross compiling no none of that it's an arm Distro. What? Is, uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, I first tried BIOS. I was like, what? <laughs> Why not Haiku? I mean, seriously, hipster. Uh, <laughs> what were you saying, Joel? Oh, oh, you know, <laughs> it was funny that you mentioned BIOS. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, this distro is built from the ground up for ARM devices. So that makes it very unique. And it, it, it's claiming it's going to use the latest Linux kernel upstream and libraries, which is really awesome because we don't have a distro that does that yet. And, um, you know, Debian and, and SUSE have versions for the, for the Pi, but it, it would be, it's nice to have for the Pi and, and other SOC boards, but it's, it's nice to have an ARM exclusive distro. That's really yeah. cool because I could also see this as helping with bringing more soft, 
more uh, Linux software to ARM because that has been an issue. Yeah, and you know, Raspberry Pi Foundation has like rolled out the App Store a couple of weeks back, which was neat. So yeah, that's uh, exactly. I, I kind of stay away. From, I still got to find my Pi Three. I know I have one. I hate. <laughs> I hate knowing something's in the house. Oh, and you can't find it. That. <laughs> you, you need to buy a pie to make a pie detector to find your other pies. No, I need to quit checking in the <laughs> freezer. <laughs> Don't act like you've never done that. Can't find the car keys. Better check the freezer. You never know. I check the freezer whenever I miss something because I may have had it in my hand and dropped it in there. It's happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's get into a little bit of feedback. How can they do that? Indeed, you can do that very easily by going to linuxgamecast.com. You hit the contact button and make sure you select LWDW from the little drop downy thing. Then you fill out the rest of the form. It's pretty easy, pretty self explanatory, and uh, we will happy to feature which, whatever bits of feedback you have, or if we got something wrong, if we got something right, but you didn't think we covered it in as much depth as you would have liked. You can let us know about that too. No promises, we will read that on the show. But we will certainly read it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's also YouTube and Patreon. Mm -hmm. Patreon, of course, gets priority because, yeah, those people are maybe crazy, but we love them. They're also our bosses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this week we have whiskey, Wesk. Wesk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh he's talking about uh, or they are talking about uh mobile linux um why has nobody managed to make a successful linux based phone yet ubuntu phone librem 5 and sailfish have either died or been reduced to curiosities it's a very good question yeah Oh boy! Well, it started I mean, way back when with WebOS. That was yeah. <laughs> was WebOS a was a thing. Yeah. Android runs on top of the Linux kernel. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I guess they're just better alternatives. <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, you got Android uh, running yeah. as a VM, basically, on um, and stuff uh, like uh, the open source uh, Android project AOSP. AOSP. It's yeah. 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 It's uh, it's the base of a multitude of different ROMs for a multitude of different devices. And uh, granted, most of them are just trying to be Android, but would need things. But there are some really dedicated use cases for some of the specific ROMs. So uh, it's just Android is huge. And yeah. it's got tons <laughs> of support. So it's a very tempting platform. Um. Yeah, the the only way you're going to break into the ecosystem for mobile phones right now with any amount of success is if you have a time machine. Or <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Because a multi-billion dollar company tried to buy their way into the mobile market. That little company was called Microsoft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They even bought Nokia. Billions. <laughs> yeah. They couldn't do it. They tapped out. They're like, oh, yeah. it's Apple. It's Android. It sucks. Uh, sailfish is neat. That hey, that one person <laughs> that listen to our show using sailfish. We yeah, that's you. a thing. Yep, uh, you can that. listen to us on sailfish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, every time you know the Ubuntu phone, whatever that was just market research. That's the only reason they did that little crowdfunding thing. They're like, mm, you know, should we make this? Let's see what the interest is. Because uh, I, uh, I like the specs on that phone. Yeah. I really did. Um, yeah, I would like. You know, Linux on a device that would make touch, you know, like, I remember when uh, Canonical had uh, Unity out, and I was like, that would make sense on a touchscreen teacher. And his touchscreen didn't make sense there. Maybe GNOME 3. Hopefully. Yeah. I would the, like the, something. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Oh, um, the KDE Plasma is actually really quite nice on a phone. Yeah, but I, then you got to run I, KDE. I, <laughs> yeah, but it, it actually works, I think, better on the phone than it does the desktop. And See, Plasma Mobile <laughs> is actually pretty stable compared to the desktop version. Yeah. Of the yeah. Nah, man, we, we need a Linux phone, straight CLI. Um. Yeah, and, it, and it's sad because, you know, what happened to Firefox OS and then with Ubuntu, with their, their Synergy, uh, honestly, with the Ubuntu, I think they were just a little bit too early on it, um, a little ahead of their time. See, that's uh, kind of the problem. Wants... I, I know yeah. that's a more polite way of saying, yeah, a little too early. It's like, there, there's no room in the market. 
Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, where the apps are. If Google. I can't install, yeah. you know, my YouTube's, my Google stuff, a uh, decent web browser, and yeah. you know, then you got all your social media crap. Then your phone, your mobile's got to work as an actual mobile. I think Selfish is the closest thing to that, but that's kind of geared more yeah. towards feature phones. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, and it needs a powerful uh, SOC to run on to make it, you know, really, really useful. So, yeah, no, Android, for all its shortcomings, for all the Googleness behind mm -hmm. it, it's the king. Well, except for Google. Google's getting ready to ditch Android. Oh, yeah, Fuchsia yeah. and Chrome. And Fuchsia. <laughs> Chrome OS is a oh, yeah. completely side topic. I've been looking to buy, like, a personal tablet for me, and I'm really thinking about that Acer Chrome tab. Yeah. Yeah, oh, no, it's nice. uh, it's been getting a lot of really good reviews. Mm -hmm. it, it, you're still running that seller on um, Intel processor, but no. it's x86. It's running Chrome. You can get Crouton easy up and running, and the Linux apps with Christini are coming soon. So, hey. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, that's the answer. That's yeah. the answer. The yeah, Linux OS. phone <laughs> no. is going to be running Chrome OS. Yeah, that's, there we go. Yeah, that's what I've been wanting ages ago. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Maybe it'll happen before the eventual heat death of the universe. All right. Um, last but not least, a, a, a very tech. Yeah, every a, tech. Every tech. Every tech. Yeah. It's from YouTube. See, we do include these occasionally. Uh, right, Tyvin. I was wondering if it's possible to use this HDMI capture card talking about the USB thing I reviewed like two weeks ago or last week, whatever it was. It was a date and then with the Y uh, capture card with a Raspberry Pi is USB 3.0 a hard requirement or would it work with USB 2.0? So I did well, it. Go ahead. Since you know, we you, kind you of have already, no, 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 no. We kind of already answered mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Now, listen, that's a broad, re uh, broad request. <laughs> I just see the word works. I don't see a modifier to like well or works good or yeah. works without giving people seizures. <laughs> I'm sure it would work, but it would not definitely not work at 60 frames per second. That that would be an issue. It's hard enough to just, just to get the pie to do full HD correctly. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I mean, it's a video for Linux 2 compliant device. A lot of these new capture cards, the one I ordered, it, uh, the PCI Express version, is just that. I mean, they, they show up as webcam. So as long as your a Raspberry Pi can accept a webcam, it should be able to uh, yeah. run this mm -hmm. in 2.0 mode. It'll do 1080 at 30, but that would probably, as Jill said, curb check a Pi, even a Pi 3 yeah. plus or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You might yeah, be able with to get away with 720, 30 possibly because yeah reasons would yeah. the pi 3 be plus if you yeah. have a slow enough uh uh ethernet connection or you're just using wi-fi you can get most of the uh usb 3 throughput but you would need a 3b plus well, even mm -hmm. the USB, uh, the network interface is running over USB 2 on the Pi Plus. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> You're still limited by the 2.0 bus. Yeah. Why even that, call that, it USB 3 then? <laughs> uh, well, it's the same reason they call it gigabit. I don't know. Because <laughs> it's not. I mean, technically, it's a gigabit metal connector there on the end to plug things into. It's just, all right. Anyway. Hey, beautiful people. We got to get out of here. It's been fun. We enjoyed hanging out with you. Uh, come check us out. Uh, have, do you guys do anything tomorrow, Jill? Um, we don't. We uh, Jordan and I haven't talked yet, so we don't don't know what game. They don't have about. a clue, so tune no, but, in at 7. We will later today. Uh, <laughs> and we'll be back Saturday where uh, Pedro, myself, and Jordan, we're going to talk about that Linus Tech tips is it uh, is that the yes. full name linus tech tips yep. okay yes um we're going to talk about that video and why it's awesome and we love it and it's the best thing ever for linux gaming uh, to date and um mm -hmm. it'll be a thing <laughs> see totally cut friday straight. Fubar. yep oh yeah friday friday uh trivia <laughs> night come check that business out it's it's a show i don't know Yay. how i forgot about it because i host it um that yeah. would have been strange <laughs> it's brilliant 
All right. Uh, we're going to roll some credits and hopefully they'll be the right ones. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, that video. It's like... I mentioned this earlier in the show. It's like, two big stories about yes. Linux this week. Uh... One... <laughs> one is about uh, someone trying Linux on their XPS, and the other one is about Linus Tech Tip using Linux. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or playing games yeah. on Linux. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the Forbes one though is definitely uh, awesome. It, it's definitely awesome in terms of the mainstream. So yeah, I think that one wins. <laughs>